The first thing that I want to say as we get into this particular installment of Unsung Heroes is thank you for clicking on it, because I know that many of these episodes, especially ones that feature classic and vintage cars, don't necessarily have the wider appeal, especially for younger viewers, that many of the spicy, newer, for instance, Lamar cars or Formula cars or supercars do have. They just intrinsically attract a lot of attention, whereas something like this from the 50s in indie car racing, it just doesn't have the same kind of wide appeal. And let's be honest, that's one of the main reasons why a car like this should be here, because it's exactly the kind of vehicle which deserves a spot in Unsung Heroes. Now, as you saw from the title, this is a diesel race car. Now, a lot of people are not fans of diesel. I mean, they're not called diesel heads after all, but as many of you know, I have a ton of love for diesel performance cars. I love the Volkswagen V10 diesels. I love the Audi V12s. Of course, I love the Le Mans diesels from Audi and Peugeot as well. This one is a much, much earlier example. Way before they were even on the scene in that kind of way, these Cummins diesel Indy cars were making their presence known because there is actually not just one. Now, I would actually go so far as to say that this particular vehicle, although not as visually exciting or certainly not as well known, I would definitely put on a similar pedestal to stuff like the Chaparral 2J, the Brabham BT46B, the Mazda 787B, and a number of other cars that many of us here on the channel do know about and that we do have a lot of love for, simply because we know about them more. This car doesn't get that kind of press, and unfortunately part of that is probably because it's a diesel. The reality is though, the story behind it is actually very similar to many of those cars that we love for being so oddball and so radical. So what is the story? Well, way back in 1911, the very first Indy 500 event took place, and one of the crew members on the winning team of that first event was a certain Clessy Cummins. And this Clessy Cummins would go on to actually found Cummins Diesels in 1919 in Columbus, Indiana, incidentally. Now, Cummins did not enter the Indy only once with this car. They actually built five different cars and entered the Indy 500 itself at least four times, from what I could find in 1931, 1934, 1950, and 1952. Now, as far as I could tell, it was never done again, not by them or anyone else. And you can probably guess why, considering a lot of the cars that I reference, like Chaparral and Brabham, but of course, we'll get to that later. So where does this car come in? Well, those previous cars from 1931, 34, etc., they were all very impressive cars in their own way. And with each new variation of IndyCar rules, each new vehicle that Cummins built, and each new independent manufacturer like Jusenberg, on this occasion Curtis Craft, that they paired with to build these vehicles, they got better and better. And although they didn't win, they were forces to be reckoned with. To the point, in fact, that not only were they fast by diesel standards, they were just fast in general. And even this car's predecessor, nicknamed the Green Hornet in 1950, could do over 165 miles per hour. That's some serious territory for a car way back in 1950, and that was certainly quick enough to, at least in a straight line, rival all of the other cars on the grid. However, they had mechanical issues, of course issues that can happen to any team regardless of what fuel type they use, and for one reason or another, they didn't win. Sometimes they were slower, sometimes they had mechanical issues, etc. But with this car, everything that they'd done up until that point really culminated with this vehicle in 1952. Now, in the 1952 Indy 500, the rules actually allowed for a surprising amount of variation between cars, the kind of variation that we only dream of at modern-day Le Mans 24-hour events, or certainly I do at least, the naturally aspirated cars were allowed to be up to 4.5 litres in capacity. The supercharged cars were only allowed to be up to 3 litres in capacity, but this single diesel car on the grid was allowed a very lenient 6.6 litres, or a 400 cubic inch engine. And it was turbocharged. Now, one of the reasons why it was allowed such leniency is because this is a very heavy car. Now, some of the previous ones were even heavier, but even this one, the arguably ultimate incarnation of the series, was still very heavy. This is a 1,406 kilo Indy car, which in other words is 3,100 pounds. The engine alone weighs 750 pounds, but it's a bruiser. 
Now, as I alluded to earlier on, Curtis actually teamed up with Cummins to make this vehicle, which is why it has that very distinctive, very good looking style that a lot of the Curtis Craft vehicles had from back in the day in various forms of motorsport, in fact. And that engine, incidentally, that 6.6 litre, six cylinder turbo diesel, despite being so heavy, I believe the heaviest car on the grid, if I recall correctly, still put out huge specs. 430 horsepower at four and a half thousand rpm and although it's difficult to find the torque figure at least it was for me it's probably out there somewhere though it would not surprise me at all if this thing was even running maybe more than 550 pound feet possibly even close to 600 pound feet of torque because that's simply the nature of diesels even older ones newer ones across the board they have massive torque from such low rpm now, as great as that is, it's not without its downsides. As I said, it makes the vehicle bigger and heavier. So what they actually did to counteract that is they had the engine block and the headers made of aluminum or aluminium, and the crankcase is made of magnesium. The engine itself is actually offset by five degrees, which gives a number of benefits. The car's center of gravity, for instance, is lower. It has a smaller nose area at the front, so that aerodynamic punch isn't quite as big. And it also, interestingly, allows more weight to be over the left wheels. In other words, the inside wheels, which of course aids in cornering in a very reminiscent way of what you would later see in for instance the 2000s in the Dodge Charger NASCAR in particular where the bodywork is extremely asymmetrical in effect where one side of the car is completely different the way it leans everything about it is very much so obviously an oval racer this car was similar although not quite as drastically visually extreme in that way now the car ran extremely well as soon as they tested it and they could tell immediately that this thing was going to be very very fast and in a very clever move ultimately it would be proven that they would have been absolutely right they didn't want to prove too much of what this car could do in fear of well basically whatever happens to any car like this as we saw from chaparral brabham and a number of others where it either gets banned before it even gets the chance to race or banned very quickly after regardless of if it wins or not so they started to get very very quiet about what this car could do and even in the actual qualifying there was never a single lap during all of the testing time and the qualifying time where the driver even used full throttle for a full lap. He deliberately, in effect, sandbagged with the car, which of course was much easier to do back then. They didn't exactly monitor the cars electronically like they do now, but they basically fooled everyone into thinking, oh, the, the diesel's nothing to worry about. It's bigger, it's heavier, and it's slower to boot. Plus, given the track record of some of their previous cars, which were also on occasion slower on the grid, it wouldn't have been anything new. Not really that much to worry about, in other words. So, what actually happened is in qualifying, 15 minutes before the qualifying period ended, the driver pushed the car to its limits. He hit 139 miles per hour on the Indy Oval and even beat everything on the grid in terms of qualifying time. They qualified first in a diesel car they got the pole position and even beat the four lap average speed record by over one mile per hour which doesn't sound like much but of course an average speed is a much bigger deal than just an outright speed so in actual fact a difference of only one miles per hour over those four laps is a very big deal now ultimately two cars later on I guess in that 15 minute window did ultimately qualify higher but the car entered the race it was so close to the event that they couldn't exactly outlaw it already and the car did run now the car already presented some potential issues one for instance was that massive torque that I mentioned and in the testing and qualifying the driver would occasionally push it so hard that the tread would literally tear off of the wheels which is awesome i mean i love it's it's very impractical and it's awful for racing but it just sounds so cool you've got this diesel car with so much torque that it literally shreds its own tires that's just badass across the board but in the race itself it actually was doing well it was keeping up with the pace the average speed was up with the pace but unfortunately after 180 miles of racing which in other words is 71 laps where they were keeping up with the other cars they were actually still maintaining fifth place on the grid which is not bad at all the culmination of an issue kicked in. 
and that unfortunate issue was that the turbo inlet was getting clogged with more and more debris, including rubber and various other things from the track, and it ultimately meant that they had to retire the car after those 71 laps. Now, the car was still awarded 27th place, ultimately, but the rules were changed thereafter to no longer allow diesel cars. Surprised? Me neither. So ultimately, I really do think that this is a car that deserves very much so to be in the same kind of category of respect that we give to stuff like Chaparral, Brabham, Mazda with the 787B, and the wide variety of others that we've talked about, some which won, some which didn't, but which were ultimately phased out, disqualified, banned, or just didn't achieve what they were aiming for. I ultimately actually have a huge amount of love for this car. I, as I said, love high-performance diesels, and to me, this is one of the finest examples of what a diesel is potentially capable of, and of course, those issues can actually happened to any team. Just think of Toyota, for instance, in the late 90s with the GT1. They were leading Le Mans, set for a win, and then had a tyre blowout. It's just not something you can really help. So these issues do happen, but what a car at the end of the day. And for this particular episode, if you do want to know more about their previous diesel cars, each of which is very different, and I would say very impressive, each in their own way, I've actually put a link down in the description to a site where you can read about all of them in chronological order. And there's a lot of very interesting stuff there if you want to check it out. But if you want to check out more episodes from a variety of other vehicles in this series, you can click right here on screen. But for now, as always, thanks for watching.